Hi, glad you can join me. Is this song gay? Hmm, tastes a little heterosexual, huh? How about this? Oh, now that tasted like fresh fruit, right? Why? Why does some music remind us of queerless by gay sexuals and other music the back of a CVS? The answer to this question involves domination under capitalism, twinks and bottoms, and over 7,000 gays willing to help us find the answer. What's so gay about gay music? What's so gay about gay culture? Is it actually gay? Have you considered how your carbon footprint is implicated in the developing climate crisis? I'm sorry, but we have to talk about how this video was sponsored by Ren. Climate change is happening, and it's not stopping for this video, nor is it stopping for James McAvoy's unreasonably red lips. We have to deal with it, and while I know big companies often do anti-Earth things out of our control, we gotta be real about the fact that we also kinda play a role in the future. I know how hard it is to be environmentally conscious when gas just tastes so damn good. Well, Ren makes it super easy to track your individual carbon footprint and actually do something about it. After calculating your carbon footprint, you can offset it by funding diverse carbon reduction projects. Plant a tree, weather some minerals, protect a rainforest, clean some air. All you have to do is answer a few questions about your lifestyle, and Ren makes it super easy to calculate your footprint and what steps you can take in your life to reduce it. And I know, it's impossible to completely reduce your footprint. In which case, you can fund the carbon reduction projects mentioned earlier to kind of even it out. By making monthly contributions, you're helping the environment and you get nifty updates including pictures and details about the projects you fund. So, offset your carbon footprint with Ren. The first 100 people who sign up using the link in the description will have 10 extra trees planted in their name. Climate change is going to affect all of us, and all of us have the power to do something. I know it feels like you're powerless to do anything. But Ren makes it really easy to make a real difference, especially when so many amazing projects are just waiting for your support. So again, click that link in the description. Think about the impulse burrito you bought yesterday and all those impulse burritos you'll buy in your lifetime. If instead you put that money towards funding a carbon reduction project, you could be saving rainforests. Let's do our part. Click the link in the description. You won't regret it. Anyways, a few weeks ago when I was looking for a playlist on Spotify to serve as the background music for a bisexually neurotic Sims 3 binge, I came across a seemingly innocuous playlist. Deserved. Talented, brilliant, amazing, show-stopping. And gay. The playlist was full of fun, energetic pop and dance music sung by so-called queer icons the type of songs and artists historically associated with queer people. I mean, six Lady Gaga songs, bro. And to be honest, I was amazed. Nothing in the title or description of the playlist alluded to the inherent gayness, yet I instantly recognized that this was Spotify's way of compiling gay people music. Now most people watching this might be saying, wait a minute, gay people music? What the hell does sexuality have to do with music taste? Well this playlist compelled me to ask the same question. Why is some music more gay than other music? What is it about this specific amalgamation of songs that urges one to think of gay people? But maybe I had it all wrong. Maybe these songs aren't gay. Maybe gay people don't even exist. Wait a second. There's several thousand gay people I could ask right now. So I designed a survey that would help me get to the bottom of this playlist for bottoms. And believe it or not, it was gay. First, I created two spreadsheets, Playlist 1 and Playlist 2. Playlist 1 had 50 songs randomly selected from Deserved, and Playlist 2 had 50 songs randomly selected from Today's Top Hits, which is basically Spotify's collection of the current most popular songs. That way, most people would know some of the songs from the comparison playlist since it's literally just what's popular. It served as the control group. After removing identifying information from the spreadsheets, I designed a scenario and proceeded to lie to 5,000 people. For gay science, two people were asked to create a playlist of their favorite songs. 
One of these people is LGBTQ+, and one is not. Here are the results. And I linked both spreadsheets with the song lists. I then asked, if you were to guess which playlist belongs to the LGBTQ plus person, which one would it be? I received 5,526 responses, and according to the survey, 93.4% of the responses were from queer people. So, which playlist is gayer? Maybe it all ends here, and it turns out that I'm just some neurotic homo queerosexual whose whole personality can be summed up by this color palette. A surprisingly sexual 69.9% .9 of respondents said that the songs from Deserved belong to the queer person versus 30.1% of respondents who said that the songs from today's top hits belong to the queer person. So it isn't just me. The songs from Deserved are gayer, or at least we perceive them to be gay, but are they a certain type of gay? Some of the comments I received in response to the survey question how representative the selection of songs really was. Honestly, it was tough because Playlist 1 felt like it was put together by a queer man, and Playlist 2 was put together by a queer woman, solely based on that the artists featured on each are associated heavily with these cultures respectively. Playlist 1 felt the most stereotypically gay, moreover, a white gay guy, though not everything in there, obviously. They are both gay, but one is a gay POC and the other isn't. Hmm, I kind of get frustrated with playlists like this. It's always queer people listen to this music, and it's usually, specifically, white queer people. One of those playlists seems a lot whiter than the other. Playlist 1 is the more stereotypical white gay guy, but Playlist 2 doesn't feel super straight either, in my opinion. Huh. Why is it that the music that felt so instinctually gay also seems to be so... white and male? As an ambiguously brown person, it caused me a small crisis. Why is this specific type of energetic pop music perceived to be the culture's gay music when it only seems to be a specific type of gay person's music? I dabble in gay things, and sure, I enjoy energetic pop music on some days, but it isn't my favorite music, and it isn't the favorite music of a good portion of the gay people I know, which is all of them. At the same time, I still feel a connection to this style of music because it makes me think of the gay lifestyle and I love thinking. There's gotta be more to the story. Well, this is that story. I'm going to talk about the roles companies like Spotify play in the production of culture and how Spotify's playlist making framework reflects a larger ideology of consumption, an ideology that works to control how the public perceives queer people and how queer people perceive themselves. Spotify is a cultural middleman, or a middle person if you find the woke mob kinda hot. As a middle something, Spotify stands between people and culture. Spotify has the power to give certain cultural objects, like songs, legitimacy via Spotify's role as a cultural intermediary. What does that mean? First, if we think of culture as meanings, norms, and values, that people collectively understand in a given society, then we can imagine a world in which some people are responsible for giving objects like commodities certain values and meanings. And the meanings and values that this object represents warrants a certain reaction of respect, hate, love, derision, and so on. Traditionally, the term capital is for econ bros with troubled father figures, but these bros traditionally define the term capital as wealth that can be used for economic production to make profit. For example, vehicles are capital. They help companies profit by transporting goods like this dress to your local white woman. Raw silicon is the material capital used to make profit on this shot glass. Tools, buildings, machinery, equipment, raw materials, stocks, basically anything you use to make profit is capital. But the most expressive French forehead of the 20th century, Pierre Bourdieu, formally created a sociological theory of cultural capital. He applied the economic definition of capital to culture. People intentionally and unintentionally use cultural resources or cultural capital to distinguish themselves as members of a certain social class. According to Bourdieu, there's three forms of cultural capital. Objective, embodied, and institutional. Objective cultural capital is literal stuff. 
works of arts you own, nice shoes, season three of Young Sheldon on DVD, and so on. Embodied cultural capital has to do with how a person uses their body. Do you speak in highly formalized language? Do you know which fork is for eating and which one is for sticking up your- Institutional cultural capital are forms of cultural capital recognized by formal institutions and organizations. Things like your useless political science degree, qualifications on your resume, professional credentials, the works. Essentially, sexy French sociologist man said that physical, bodily, and institutional cultural resources on average work to distinguish social clashes from each other. This is both intentional and unintentional on the part of the person. Sometimes rich people want to flex, but a lot of the time, it isn't necessarily a flex. From birth, society draws people to different forms of cultural capital in a subconscious way. We all have different tastes in music, art, food, twinks, but Bourdieu argued that taste isn't something that develops completely organically. While genetics and random life experience certainly plays a role in taste, Bourdieu argued that a large portion of taste is social. What does that mean? People acquire their cultural tastes from the experiences that come with their social position, their formal education at institutions, like the Homosexual Agenda Recruitment Center and their informal education with their communities in the everyday, like these gentlemen who are probably discussing continental philosophy. According to the studies Bourdieu completed in the 20th century, on average, the rich and poor empirically have different subjective tastes in art, music, food, and so on. What we perceive to be natural and random differences in taste are in large part determined by our positions in social hierarchies but it also contains an element of domination, not in a good way. The elite's cultural tastes become naturalized as the most legitimate form of taste. The so-called lower class has been primed by society to like certain cultural elements, yet society simultaneously shuns the working class for these same tastes by calling them less legitimate. By what mechanism are some twinks considered elite and others not so much? Well, in part, it's the middlemen. Consumer societies require Tastemakers. Bros on podcasts telling you why they think movies containing women suck. Critics, bloggers, marketing experts, and all varieties of people that stand in between the cultural product and the consumer. Bourdieu called these people cultural intermediaries. Essentially, these tastemakers play a big role in deciding which cultural products we appoint to contain a certain level of perceived cultural capital. Tastemakers give products cultural value. And it's not that these people have some special power that gives them the ability to have an ultimate natural taste in all cultural goods. That's what society wants you to think. In reality, they inhabit a social position, usually that of an upper middle class to upper class person, that aligns their interests with the interests of the dominant social order. It's a little abstract, but basically they've been raised in a dominant class position and in the culture of that dominant class, they have the power to tell everyone else, yep, the tastes of the upper middle class have been ordained by the universe as the only legitimate form of culture because I said so. And it's important to note, tastemakers are not what most would call elite per se, Cultural intermediaries are not billionaires, and they don't have evil intentions. They don't wake up every day and go, I'm going to impose my cultural will onto the world. They genuinely believe in the legitimacy of their tastes because in a cyclical way, the structure of society today allows them to believe it. The tastes of the cultural intermediary reflect their upbringing in the dominant cultural class. In the book, The Cultural Intermediary's Reader, the authors state, the literary critic writes with a perfect sincerity which is essential in order to be believed and therefore effective. The harmony between the personal and the professional generates a sincere disposition which is fundamental to the effectiveness of the new occupations, symbolic and ethical impositions. As a result, cultural intermediaries do not experience their work as instrumental calculation because it is an expression of their own taste and dispositions. In short, they sell so well because they believe in what they sell. Wait, but some art has to be objectively better than other art, right? My boomer father told me the Beatles were musical genies. It's all about frameworks. The Beatles are objectively good within a framework that places value on Western classical music techniques. But who decided that that was to be the framework for measuring artistic value? Why not measure artistic value in pee or poo? Because the tastemakers said so. 
So how do we get from cultural intermediaries to the music of bottoms? Subcultures. Those groups that exist outside the mainstream. Subcultures value cultural objects different from those valued by the general culture. Playing a $75 Guitar Center ukulele might not hold a lot of cultural value in the general public, but it might make you a god on ambiguously gay Tumblr. Mainstream society might not value being an insufferable asshole, but I heard that does well on Twitter. What about the gay community? Are there forms of cultural capital that do well with the homos? Let's get to the bottom of this. Or the bottom responsible for this. The strategy is based on the playlist itself. Each has its own hypothesis, theme, or audience that we're thinking about. So sorry, just the gay agenda. Anyways, Spotify is a music streaming service that allows users to spend 30 minutes looking for the perfect 20 minute queue of music before a 10 minute shower. As an integral part of the Spotify experience, the playlist feature allows users to curate a list of songs that most reflect their identity, mood, and tastes. However, the Spotify platform also plays a role in curating music for users with its algorithm-generated personalized playlists that allow users to discover new music. And the subject of our interest and the category of the playlist under which deserve falls, the editorial playlist. Editorial playlists give employees or editors at Spotify complete discretion over which indie artists get to eat tonight. That is, they decide which songs go on their popular public playlists. In essence, Spotify acts as one of music's cultural intermediaries. Editorial playlist topics are endless. Some are based around specific genres, some are compilations of top hits, artist discographies, and sad lesbians, moods, settings, identities, communities, you name it. How do editors decide which songs deserve a spot on editorial playlists? Do they use a complex algorithm to instrumentally calculate which styles certain communities enjoy? Do they have meticulous checklists that follow a standardized process? Not really. Mostly it's just vibes. Every editor has a different philosophy, but they essentially have the final opinion over which songs belong to certain contexts. That's where the cultural work comes in. Spotify for Artists published several interviews with these editors a while back, and I was able to observe exactly the type of taste-making work Bourdieu described over 40 years ago in his theories. We also look at what is happening in culture, artists pushing the boundaries and always consider a myriad of music characteristics when curating, from BPM and tempo to song structure and key signature. Each of our editors are unique and work differently, but they all seek inspiration from different music publications and cultural moments. With all of these lists, the intention is more about programming the space for a specific audience versus a specific genre. That's generally our approach in creating a new playlist. Identifying where there is a community that has a demand for a specific listening experience, where there's a culture brewing all of its own and meeting that demand, whether it's with a single playlist or a slate of playlists. The word that comes to mind at the end of the day is authenticity. Knowing culturally where an artist fits is something that I'm always keeping top of mind. The Spotify playlist editor stands between the musical product and the audience, between sapphics and the saddest music on earth, between bisexuals and panic at the 1975 Janelle Moan David Bowie, between gay men and the worst music I've ever heard. While I can't prove that tastemakers within these subgroups are all middle to upper classes of these subgroups reproducing the same musical culture, I can use deserved as a tiny microcosm of a larger process, one in which people from dominant class positions take control of the cultures to which they belong. According to a study on musical streaming that applies Bourdieu's theories to Spotify, playlist curators frame cultural goods as legitimate and provide these goods symbolic cultural capital on the basis of the editor's knowledge of the cultural field and its audience. Spotify editors are in the business of making culture and subculture because they're familiar with the audiences. But how do they do this? Let's revisit the quote from earlier. The strategy is based on the playlist itself. Each has its own hypothesis, theme, or audience that we're thinking about. So, when I look at Deserved, what do I think the hypothesis, theme, and audience is? 
In which social context does this collection of songs make sense? A funeral? On the radio of a Mexican grandma cleaning the house? If you answered on the iPod of a high schooler with dyed hair eating in the English teacher's classroom during lunch, anywhere in West Hollywood or any otherwise non-heterosexual context, then you're correct. Deserved is gay. But it's not gay in that the artists are gay or that the songs have explicitly gay themes. A lot of these songs were written by straight women about straight relationships. Yet the majority of my queer audience identified the queerness of these songs without any explicit markers of their queerness via queer lyric or artist. The playlist deserved happened when Spotify decided to make queerness a hypothesis. But how is that possible? How can queerness be a hypothesis? To really understand this question, I'll propose a rough theory of queerness in consumerist societies. Maybe it'll help us understand what deserved is all about. If we're able to understand why deserved looks the way it does, then we might be able to understand which people play the largest role in creating what queer culture looks like today. But I will caution everyone, this is a very limited theoretical model because one, it's a YouTube video presented by a small Venezuelan man, and two, because it presents a very Western-centric account of history and queerness in order to be relevant to a Western organization like Spotify. I encourage people to build on it from a non-Western perspective. So, families. Whether you're South American with 36 cousins or a Southern American married to someone in a concerning location within the cousin-spouse Venn diagram, most of us consider our family life to be separate from our work, professional, and public life. In contemporary capitalist societies, the family belongs to the private sphere, much like this space. But... It wasn't always that way. In the past, the separation between the private family sphere and the public economy sphere wasn't a thing. Before the rise of contemporary capitalism, before industrialization, most considered the family to be an economic unit, a unit of production. The family was the sphere where you made foods and goods for the village, where you divided labor between husband and wife. Little cringe, but most people depended on their heterosexual family units for food and subsistence. And marriage itself? Marriage wasn't about romantic love. Marriage was about the exchange of property and wealth between families. I guess that prompts the homoerotic question. In this climate where heterosexual marriage, family, and economy were ubiquitously linked, where did queer people fit? It wasn't until the 19th and 20th century separated the family and economy that the conditions for a homosexual identity were created. John D'Amelio, a historian of sexuality, argues that queer communities and identities didn't emerge until the capitalist economy really began to take off. The argument goes, in the past, economy and family were unequivocally linked. However, with the development of the modern capitalist economy, individuals no longer depended on family units to have one's living needs fulfilled. Instead, they could sell their labor to a local capitalist and become self-sufficient. Over the course of the modern period, however, marriage became less and less about economic exchange and production and more about individual private satisfaction and happiness despite what boomer comedians claim. I hate my wife. With these changes, people without heterosexual attractions, the gays, no longer needed to depend on the heterosexual family unit. Instead, as individual laborers in a new and shiny world, they could now separate from the heterosexual institution of marriage. Queer people could form communities outside of heterosexual neighborhoods and institutions and they could organize around an identity connected to a similar fringe experience. Sexuality was no longer an institutional affair connected to economic production, but an individual identity. Out of the industrial development of the late 19th and early 20th century came the word, and therefore the identity, homosexual. The moment people no longer needed families to survive economically was the moment that queerness as a concept began to make sense within the social paradigm. 
And just as the concept of queerness emerged, so too did the queer community. The development of that silly community is complex, involving a host of factors including post-World War I and World War II transient young people roaming around in Newport cities and doing gay stuff in urban places. But for the sake of simplicity, let's just say that with all these individuals roaming around unbound by heterosexualism, different gay communities emerged around the world. And by the mid-20th century, thousands of urban centers had their own district of gays. If we pay close attention to mid-20th century queer communities, then I think we uncover some of the ways fundamentally queer history distinguishes itself from cis-hetero institutions. And we ultimately get closer to the answer to our question. When we think of modern heterosexual institutions, the Live Laugh Love Empire, the Midwest, Cheddar Jack Cheese, the whole thing, or more fundamentally, the private nuclear family, this family unit as we know it today emerged from an economic progression. The modern heterosexual family only exists because the dominant social system wanted to make room for capitalist production. Companies can only exist if individuals decide to leave their heterosexual homes and go to the workplace. On the other hand, queer communities in the 20th century these physical communities where queerness enjoyed limited material freedom represented something a little outside of capitalism for a little bit. Against the heterosexual family unit, queer people in the 20th century flocked to queer spaces of communal living. They formed their own non-blood families, their own economic bubbles, and they engaged in acts of political solidarity. Anytime queer people get physically together in gay bars like this one, in hot topics, on pirate ships, in these physical communities, they create their own outsider institutions. Specific social formations of queer people grouping together and getting things done together. In essence, these queer communities represented separate power structures outside of mainstream heterosexual structures. And anywhere these alternative queer institutions exist, they represent queer power structures. Then the 60s happened. We all know our good friend the 60s, it's always painted as this time of change, a sort of crossroads in political and social life. A time where revolution and fundamental reform seemed possible. A number of different social movements hit their mainstream peak and visibility. The women's movement, the black freedom struggle, the Chicano movement, the student movement, the British, and of course, the beginning of the gay liberation movement after the 1969 Stonewall riots. It's always difficult to simplify these moments, but let's just frame it this way. The Stonewall Riots, this big uprising after a police raid on a New York gay bar, represented the beginning of queer people realizing their collective power. In that vein, the gay community had two different options in how they wanted queer identity to be defined moving forward. Was the queer community going to strengthen existing physical queer communities and queer power structures? Or was the queer community going to integrate within historically heterosexual institutions? Was queerness going to be about challenging public institutions with counter institutions? Or was queerness to be a private affair that exists inside a private marriage? Institutions represent moments in which a collective group of people reproduce a particular social pattern or system. So if queerness was to be a community defined by distinct institutions outside of the heterosexual world, that's essentially saying that queer culture was going to be defined by our collective subversive power to reproduce a type of queer social system. A world where we all use our collective power to bring Mitski to the gayberhood. But if queerness was to be a private ordeal, then queer culture would be decided by the private consumer individual. Each person uses their own individual power to find Mitski wherever she is. And the tension between these two possibilities isn't settled today. The 1960s simply defined the question. The answer is always in contest. But in a market economy, like the one we live in today in the United States, queerness as a private act of consumption seems to be the future most of us have accepted. Why this is the case should be clear in a second. If queerness were to be an institution rather than an individual experience, then all queer people, regardless of social status and class, benefit from the collective power of the community. However, if queerness is a private act, if queerness is something that an individual does 
then not all classes or types of queer people have the same ability to participate in the public sphere because not all people have equal opportunities. Some people are named Brayden. And that brings us back to Bordeaux and Bottoms. If private individual queerness is the dominant paradigm, how do you then identify yourself as gay within the culture? For example, you can usually tell with about 90% accuracy whether someone is white. Of course, race is complex, socially constructed, and the idea of looking a certain race is a problematic topic. But somewhere between the Golly G. Willikers. and the white skin, the Caucasian is usually apparent. Gracias, Roberto. Race is pretty physical. Not always, but usually pretty physical. Hot take? White people are white. Some social categories, like race or gender, have on average physical identifiers that we've come to associate with those categories. These identifiers may not always be accurate, of course, and they have a historical character, but it's undeniable that we've all been conditioned by society to associate certain types of bodies and attributes with certain categories. Again, giant sociological topic, giant nuances we'll never get to. On the other hand, how do you identify someone as being gay? The clothes they wear? Their mannerisms? How do you identify yourself as gay? Dudes don't walk around with other dudes' dicks in their mouth and there's no real mark of gay that we have on our skins other than that star, Brandon. Maybe there's language? Some studies suggest that there's a correlation between certain types of speech patterns and gaily being a gay. Some people associate certain mannerisms with being gay as well. Well, what did Bordeaux teach us about mannerisms and language? Our mannerisms, our language, our embodied cultural capital. They're partially a result of social conditioning. Not all gay people talk the same. And some studies find that use of the gay voice varies in different social contexts. When people identify as queer, they might consciously or subconsciously choose to embody what the culture has decided is queer. One study found that gay speakers change the tone of their voice to sound stereotypically gay depending on whether they thought their speaking partner accepted their queerness. Researchers also found that YouTubers who come out as gay are also more likely to talk gay in later videos. Is this a function of revealing your true self after finding an accepting audience? perhaps, but either way, people consciously and subconsciously change how they present themselves in the social world given certain contexts. Hey Queen, did you catch the new Troye Sivan album? I'm homophobic. Uh, it's, I mean the last night's episode of football. I'm British. Ew. But there are additional ways to distinguish oneself as queer beyond language and mannerisms. Clothes, movies, drinks, music, food, all of these cultural objects contain within them a certain value in terms of how queer they are. In that sense, they contain a certain level of cultural capital in terms of queer capital. How gay is it? Mm. You don't think queer cultural capital is real? Out of these two TV shows, which has more queer cultural capital, Pawn Stars or Glee? Which is queerer? A ham and cheddar subway sandwich or this candy cane? Subtle, huh? Cultural elements not only carry connotations with economic classes, but with different social categories. Some things are culturally gayer than others. Some playlists are gayer than others. But here lies the issue. Since queerness isn't something physical, identifying queerness is limited to whatever that society has labeled queer. And society attaches queer labels to things we consume. Oftentimes, the only way we can distinguish ourselves as queer is through our consumption. Which movies we stream, which coffees we drink, which shorts we jort, which person wears the flannel. Because in the 60s, queer identity began a path that ended with queerness defined by private individual consumers, not by a community with separate institutions and power structures. But who is doing this? Who specifically decided that queerness should be a private individual experience and who decided which consumers define and produce queer cultures today? Let's take a look back at Deserved. So we know the playlist is gay. The queer people in my audience determine its gayness by a statistically significant margin. Culturally, it's seen as gay, but is it actually gay? 
As in, do queer people actually listen to this style of music? So, I designed another survey. After listening to Deserved for 48 hours straight, I designed a new survey that would measure a few things. Whether people were LGBTQ+, their sexual orientation, gender, race, class, age, and what type of music they enjoyed. Measuring people's music taste involved asking people to rank seven different moods of music, and then asking them to pick their favorite genre from a list. It's a little simplistic, but it's for a YouTube video, so. I received about 6,000 responses before I started data analysis. Don't you just love data? I also put the deserved playlist into several Spotify playlist analyzers to see which moods and genres were the most frequent. Overall, deserved included happy, energetic, dance, and pop music. For data analysis, I created several categories of music taste that I thought aligned with the type of music in deserved. So, there were three categories of Deserved that I used to measure the music in Deserved. Deserved one was the narrowest category. People in this category ranked hopeful, happy, and energetic music highly, and their favorite genre was either pop or dance music. Deserved two was a little broader. Um, this excluded happy music from mood rankings because I know there are a lot of sad gay people, and Deserved three was the broadest category, and this applied to anyone who ranked energetic type music in their top three music moods, and anyone who listed pop and dance music as their favorite genre. Then I ran a logistical regression, whatever the hell that is, and this allowed me to control for race, socioeconomic status, gender, and sexual orientation. Essentially, if we control for these variables, we can't attribute someone's preferred music taste to any of these other underlying factors. So, I did the regression, and uh, Guys, I think there are a lot of gay people watching. Now, the fact that I was just polling people who saw my link, most of which are internet dwelling queers, limits the generalizability of this survey. However, the effect of being an internet dweller should apply relatively evenly across groups. Both the gays and straights in my audience shouldn't be too different in that regard. So it's not a complete death sentence to the results. However, some of the sample sizes in the subgroups, especially the older age categories, were too small to make any kind of determination whether or not the correlation love between data? these variables Don't just and music taste actually existed. For the three sociology grad students that get off to Stata tables, here's the full sexy regression results. To begin, let's go over a few fun facts. So, uh, it looks like, uh, bisexuals really like punk rock music, you fruity, fashionable flunkies. Just being bisexual makes you 2.1% more likely than others to choose punk and 2.7% more likely to choose rock as your favorite genre. Pansexuals. I don't know why you're 8.8% .8 less likely to like hip-hop than others, but I guess that's just how it is. And, uh... None of the genres had any type of correlation with being asexual. I don't know if that's because the sample size is too small or because you all don't have any type of musical attraction, but it's fine. Heterosexuals in my audience, you're more likely to rank both sad and happy music as high compared to non-heterosexuals. Please, as you like telling bisexuals, pick a side. And in terms of preferred genre, controlling for everything, race, class, gender, etc., being an LGBT person makes you more likely to have picked punk as your favorite genre and less likely to have picked pop and R&B. Enough playing, let's look at the results for Deserved. Is Deserved the music of gay white people, at least in my audience? Well, no. Being a gay man, a gay white man, an upper middle class white man, an upper middle class gay white man, queer white man, an upper middle class queer white man, just about every combo of privilege with the range of Jonathan Groff is not really associated with liking the music in Deserved. And this is across all three categories of Deserved. Most of these identity categories had no association with liking Deserved, and the times that it did have that association with Deserved, these categories were negatively associated with that type of music. Let's use the narrowest definition of Deserved, where I categorize the style of music as happy, hopeful, energetic, pop, and dance music. This is the version that's most specific and accurate um, as a characteristic of Deserved style. Most of the variables on my regression have no relationship to Deserved. 
if this p part of the table is less than 0 0.05, that means there's some type of relationship between the variable and deserved. As you can see, most of these are greater than 0 0.05, with the exception of the 25 to 34 age group and Hispanics represent. But just look at the queer variable and the socioeconomic variables. The effect of queerness is super statistically significant. The p-value is basically zero, and the effect is negative. Being a queer person, controlling for all of these factors, means you're 4.7% less likely to like the music on Deserve than non-queer people. And this negative relationship is consistent across all definitions of Deserve. The other significant category, socioeconomic status. Being middle or upper income compared to being lower income is associated with a higher likelihood of enjoying the music in Deserve. The people in my audience who like the music Deserved aren't the queers. It's the higher income people. Yet why did such a large portion of this same audience label the playlist Deserved as the queerer playlist? Let me again theorize about the subject. If in the 1960s, queer culture suddenly became more and more defined by private individuals and consumers rather than collective community ideas, then the people who can afford to consume would be the ones that have the most influence over queer culture. The upper middle class tastemakers who stand between the consumer and the producer most influence what is considered legitimate or accepted culture. The music in Deserved isn't super representative of the tastes and culture of most queer people, but those in the queer community who represent the upper class and the people most likely to have picked Deserved are those with the most powerful voice in any given community. Now, the connection between dance music and the queer community is complicated, but this genre didn't emerge from upper middle class communities. House and disco originated in economically diverse queer communities of color in Chicago and New York in the 70s and 80s. Of the early New York parties from which disco first originated, expert Alex Rosner stated, It was probably about 60% black and 70% gay. There was a mix of sexual orientation, there was a mix of races, mix of economic groups, a real mix, where the common denominator was music. So this type of dance culture has real roots in diverse queer institutions on the ground. However, as these communities changed over time, as consumption prevailed over collective community strength, urban nightlife became less accessible to non-white and working class communities in the late 20th century. Upper class gays who could afford to party could also afford to define queer culture especially in a new individualist context. As I said before, the 60s put the queer community at a crossroads to choose between a path of community and collective strength or a path of individualist consumption. With the rise of neoliberalism, just some spooky thing, in the 1980s, mainstream American culture was headed towards individualist ideology and evil, but overall just individualist ideology. And the queer community felt these changes as well. While some queer activists and communities remained radical and focused on subaltern struggles worldwide, others shifted their focus towards queerness as an individual rights issue. For more conservative queer thought leaders, the queer struggle wasn't about strengthening alternative institutions and building separate power structures. The queer struggle was about individual queer people who deserved equal rights in an already existing institution the right to marry, wear polos, and join the existing institutions that had previously excluded them. Individualist queer activists were optimistic about the ability of these institutions to bring meaningful change. Now, I won't take sides and say who has the best path towards the ultimate good. That's not my job right now. But I can talk about the consequences of an individualist queer ideology. Mainstream gay advocacy organizations have pursued individual and family-based rights and turned away from liberationist or radical demands for dismantling oppressive systems or promoting sexual freedom or pleasure. We can see this vision reflected in the primary goals of the national movement through the 2010s, same-sex marriage and family recognition rights, market and cultural visibility, access to the military, and hate crime slash safety legislation. So in the late 20th century, moving into the 21st century, queer culture became less determined by physical alternative communities, especially as these gayborhoods slowly started to wither away for a variety of complex reasons. Instead, consumption patterns come to determine queer culture more than anything else. 
If you don't have a physical community and alternative power structures, then other than gushing over James McAvoy, how are you supposed to recognize a fellow queer in a consumption-oriented context? This isn't a queer-specific thing either. A lot of Americans' identities overall are defined by what we consume. Taste and culture become interlinked in consumer economy, remember? Sexy French? There's a kind of dual character to queerness in an advanced capitalist society. A kind of double life. On the one hand, even in a consumption context, queerness is still defined by a type of attraction and identity. And in that sense, queerness has few barriers to entry because, theoretically, queer people can come from all types of backgrounds. And that's true. But on the other hand, queerness in the social world has also become a taste, a cultural sense. Studies find that working class people who have done what most people would consider gay adjacent stuff at least, like mutual dude kissing and having same gender attraction, these working class people are less likely to identify as LGBTQ plus than their middle and upper class counterparts. Working class people feel alienated by the social conception of a highly consumerist queer identity. As I said, given the lack of inherent physical indication of someone's queerness, there's few ways to express a connection to queer culture other than telling someone your identity, or the more complex part of the identity expression, the unspoken cultural marks, we choose to speak our identity for us. In a consumer society, people must signal their queerness through Doc Martens, earrings, crop tops, corduroy, consumption patterns that not everyone can afford. And when working class people move about the world, when they're told queer culture is a certain style of dress they can't access, then they're going to feel alienated from that community. Upper and middle class people get to influence what society deems to be queer culture. They are the tastemakers. They give value to cultural capital. They lift those shirts. And they play a part in that visceral reaction I had to deserved. For some reason, the songs in Deserved are called queer, despite only reflecting one part of the queer community's tastes and one part of its history. What we actually understand to be culturally queer often reflects what really is just the queer culture of the middle and upper class. And pretending like mainstream gay culture is totally representative masks the unequal reality. Now, I said that my audience ranked Deserved as the playlist gayer than the Top Hits playlist. So we all collectively determined that it's gay. So I don't necessarily have the specific details on why or how Deserved was created, but I found that Spotify created a Pride Hub in 2016 to compile LGBTQ plus music, which still exists today. And with a few clicks, you can easily get to Deserved. So it's gay. And interestingly enough, every playlist in that campaign has a premise. Queer artists, queer songs, lesbians, but there are two playlists with no premise. Deserved, and this other playlist called Obsessed, which links to Deserved. Now, there's nothing wrong with these playlists, and I know gay people who like this style of music, and I know that there are queer artists on these playlists and that a poop ton of queer people connect with these songs. But why is energetic dance pop the only genre that is beyond a premise, beyond category? Because we all know it's gay? Why? Does this specific curation of songs reflect queer people's reality? I'm sure in some ways it does. But some scholars note that there's an unresolvable tension between what users seek in their music and what Spotify's tastemakers want to promote. On queer playlists, scholars Danans and Burgess write, Spotify's hybrid model of human algorithmic curation intensifies some of the key tensions inherent in the cultural logics of streaming. It apparently offers curatorial freedom and an endless library while returning the user inexorably time and again to and thereby reinforcing a canon of Western-centric LGBTQ music culture that revolves around dance floor fillers, mainstream female pop stars, and LGBTQ anthems. The question then is how and whether ordinary users are aware of, are bothered by, or change their practices in response to these algorithmic co-curation mechanisms. There is a tension between what we believe to be queer culture and the reality most queer people experience. Spotify and its tastemakers continue to manufacture this tension. 
What is the queer community's response? Is it all changing? What if we don't need the physical space of community that we had in the 20th century? Do digital spaces allow us to form symbolic online communities where collective strength can emerge again in some form? Or does the algorithm make it so that we all end up yelling at each other into reproducing the same systems of power over and over? Maybe we all play the roles of cultural intermediaries anytime we retweet communist cat girls, share Facebook misinformation, or argue for our favorite deity in the YouTube comments. I'm sure we've all read at least one post that has changed the way we look at media. But does that stand a chance to the institutional actors like Spotify, who sell our own culture back to us at a premium? Are we buying it? As we move forward in the 21st century, who are we going to let create queer culture? You decide. Wait a second, I forgot to announce something. Speaking of gay music, I wanted to announce that I have an album coming out October 1st. Do me a huge favor and please pre-save it at this link to know exactly when it's out. The album's pretty varied, so if you like whatever genre of music or bisexual Hispanics, then this album should have something of interest to you. Thanks. Hey, gay. You want to act gaily daily? Well, here's a few ways you can do that. Support this channel by checking out my merch at www.itsall.gay or consider supporting me on Patreon. Also, remember to follow my Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram. Don't forget to subscribe. Anyways, these are some people who are acting gaily daily. My patrons. Inokku, Aaron Seiler, Adeline Grubb, Adrienne Jackson, AFK Bard, Akane SVT, Allison, Amanda S, Amara, Amelia Zeke, Anarkali Ascari, Andy H, Anur Yek, Armin Newsom, Ash Aaron Horster, Asimti, Aurelia Chilinska, Autumn Moore, B, Ben the Bard, Bianca Moten, Brad the Great, Brian Lasoya, Bro Mar, Bump Girl, Violet, Kara Miller, Carla Carroll, Catboy Girl, K. Clark, C.C. Troye, Charles Hero, Charlotte, Cody Miller, Koisame, Conscious Logic, Cooper, Cucumber, Kurt Clark, Cynthia Perez, D. Ann, Dairy Dude, Dane Much, Danny Chalice, Daniel Prokop, Darcy Barbian, Darren Mad, David Kersey, Daisy Granados, The Cassoberry, Del Elliott, Draconis, Duncan, E, Aesthetic, Ellen, Elizabeth Acosta, Elizabeth Morgan, Emily, Emily Lizzle, Emily Blue, Esper Lady, Ethan Thompson, Etienne, Evan P, Everyone Took the Funny Names, Feeler, Florencia Rodriguez, Frida Jimenez, Gabriela Bradley, Gabriela Day, Georgia Rose, Gina Wallace, Grace, Gree, Hadley Grace, Hannah O, Enardo Dominguez Elvira, I Am the Fern Man, Ian T. Gray, Angelus Whipfelder, It's a Me Emily, Jackie Benavente, Jaime, Jai T. Jake the Snake Bakes a Cake by the Lake. Janin. J. Patrick. Jennifer M. Isaguirre. Jesse. Jessica Carmona. Jessica Earn. Jessica Pan. Juicebox08. June. Jurassic Dragon. Justin Chapman. Just Some Sentient Matter. Ka. K. Kale. Caleb. Kasokist. Kale P. Kara, Kimmy Giggler, Kimothy, Knights Who Say Sledge, Cosmosar, Kyle Denley, Laura V. Turner, Lauren Taylor, Leela, Leonardus Sardinianus, Lillian, Lilytron, Lindsay Laney, Linz, Liz Hirschman, Log, Lorenzo J. Yanes Jr., Luca Alexander, Lucia Garcia, 
Luke Griesehaber, Mackenzie Robin, Maddie Reyes, Madeline, Maggie H, Mighty, Malpertuous, Manwi, Margot White, Maria Raposa Branca, Marie, Marta, Matthew Franklin, Maya Maya Gutom, Megalomaniac64, Maggie and Lars, Mayjoon, Melonbug, Merle, Miguel Galan de Juana, Mika, Milo S, Miranda, Moye, Mysterious DG, Mysterious Persona, Nadine Ferris, Natasha Troom, Neutral Gay, Nicholas Bloom, Nick, Night Tripping Fairy, Nick, Nifan, Omni Technomancer, Oyster Philosophy, Paige, Paul Purgat, Paw Timer, Perdita, Peter Patrick and Mary, Paula Tess, Pop Unicorn, Raph, Ray J, Rebecca McCann, Red Sparky, R.H., Richard Knight, Roman Rosari, Ronja Adams Ramstead, Rosa Mori of the Sea, Rowan, Rising Sun, Salea, Fate Replay, Sam Cotter, Sam Kilkenny, Samantha Bonaparte, Scrimbim, Sethame Bitch, Shandon Largo, Shane Tilla Karatne, Shannon Hutchinson, Shannon M. Sean Williams, Shivangi Sikri, Senai Cruz, Cece, Slightly Yem, Suit Sprite, Soup, Steffi, Stephen N., Steve Markham, Sunny Latome, Sydney Peterman, Tangerine 15, Tanya P., Ted, Testy Tara, Taylor White, The Kimchi Witch, The Salsa, Theodore Warner, Thomas Oshagan Halagian, Tiff, Tallura, Tom Tripp, Tyler Connolly, Umaima Beige, Venom Titties, Violet Fabiana, Whitney Welts, Ren Martin, Zylon Akau MSTS, Yeston Hayes, you're doing a great job. You really don't have to read my name. <laughs>